Welcome everyone. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Good morning and a warm welcome to all of you. As Jennifer said, my name's Cheryl Kennedy and I'm the regional administrator for the USDA's Food and Nutrition Service in the Mountain Plains region. First, I wanna thank the planning committee for pulling this event together. As you saw both their names and contact information on the slide when you first logged in. They've done a great job pulling this together. So a big thank you to them. And I also wanna thank all of you for the work and passion you bring to improving the nutrition and wellness of our children. Today, I'm joined by two assistant regional administrators from the Health and Human Services, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administrations, or as we refer to as SAMHSA, and they will introduce themselves shortly. But together, the Mountain Plains region plus the Health and Human Service region seven and eight represent 10 geographical states and more than 30 sovereign nations tribal territories. You'll see on this first slide, you see have a slide that, um, there we go. This shows the map of which states are served by FNS Mountain Plains region. On the next slide, you can see which states are served by HHS region seven and eight. And this last slide shows where individual tribal territories are located within the combined regions. So we have a lot of coverage. And I want to thank all of you who have joined us here today representing each of these states and territories as we meet to examine the important connection between food and mood. And I have to give a special shout out to Iowa and Utah, which used to be in our FNS region, and we will, but we will always consider them part of the Mountain Plains. And as I mentioned, I represent the Food and Nutrition Service, or as commonly referred to as FNS. As food and nutrition are the two key words in our agency's name, it follows that these are our top priorities. Our agency's vision is to end hunger and improve nutrition in America. And we recognize the link between nutrition and physical and behavioral health, which is why we strive to feed as many Americans as we can who need it. And you will hear for, in a minute from Tracy more on how we make these connections together. But a little bit about FNS. We administer 15 nutrition assistance programs that touch the lives of one in four Americans each year. Some of our anchor programs include the Supplemental Nutrition Program, or SNAP, the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, or WIC, the National School Lunch Program, and the Commodity Supplemental Food Program, and the Farm to School. And those are just to name a few. And as we all know, without good nutrition, all subsequent tasks are very difficult and in some cases, even impossible. So we come together today to discuss the relationship between food and mood during a very difficult time in our nation's history. When the challenges of the pandemic began to set in, USDA FNS made a commitment. No matter what form of schooling was taking place, we would take swift action to ensure our children would get fed and we will continue to do so to the fullest, fullest extent of our ability. As kids continue their schooling, whether it be in person, virtually, or under a hybrid model, USDA is continuing to provide schools with support, the resources, and flexibilities so they can continue to provide nutritious meals to the children in their care. To relieve some of the stress on families to make sure the children are being fed, flexibilities are offered across the National School Lunch Program, School Breakfast, and Child and Adult Care Food Program. These flexibilities include such things as allowing the parents and guardians to pick up the meals, waiving meal patterns when necessary, and allowing meals to be served outside of standard meal times. Additionally, during the pandemic, a new program has been initiated called Pandemic EBT. You may have heard it called PEBT. And through PEBT, school children who had, would have received free and reduced school meals during the school year will now receive the temporary emergency benefits loaded on their SNAP cards so that they can be used to purchase food. So we're ensuring that they will still get the good nutrition they need. In addition to overseeing the administration of food nutrition programs, another important part of FNS's vision is to provide nutrition education. Thank you so much. Did we just get cut? Um, just a... You're okay. Okay. Just a, um, just a few weeks ago, USDA joined the HHS in issuing the dietary guidelines for 2020 and 2025. 
Um, these dietary guidelines are the first to focus on encouraging healthy eating at every life stage from birth through older adulthood with added guidance to support pregnant and lactating women. So this life cycle is the first of its kind in the dietary guidelines. And we recognize that a healthy routine is important at every stage of life and healthy choices can have positive effects that add up over time, including improved mood and emotional well-being. Another Vanessa's nutrition outreach is the farm. Looks like you froze up, Cheryl. Yeah, you froze, Cheryl. Let's see if she's coming back. I think she dropped off. Okay. Let's see. Why don't Why don't we um, Why don't we just keep moving forward? If especially if she's off, Jen, you want to okay. cue me up for the sake of time and sure. If she joins us, we'll we'll welcome her back in. You've got to love technology, it certainly is a um, trying times for folks. So good morning. Um, I'll thank Cheryl when she comes back on, but thank you, Cheryl, for your continued and support. We really appreciate your commitment in, at USDA and are super fortunate to have an excellent partnership with our regional USDA team members, um, both in the Mountain Plains and then also uh, Utah and Iowa's region as well. Um, so you guys have all heard now from the food side of our discussion. So I'm going to talk just really briefly about what we're calling the mood side of today's discussion. My name is Tracy Pohl. Um, I use the she, her pronouns, and I'm the assistant regional administrator for SAMHSA. I think Cheryl gave the long and acronym for us, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And we're based within the Federal Department of Health and Human Services um, here in Region 8. Um, which includes Colorado, Montana, North and South Dakota, Utah, Wyoming, and then 33 recognized tribes. So I'm also joined by my colleague, Kim Reynolds from the SAMHSA Region 7 office in Kansas City, and she's gonna introduce herself here in just a second. You can go to the next slide. Perfect. So as I mentioned, I, I think we have the luxury and a great privilege to be able to work in a regional office setting. So for folks on the phone who may not be calling in from either of the two regions that are uh, centralized to the discussion today. These are some of the SAMHSA folks that are identified. We're small and mighty teams that support tribal, state, and community-based organizations when they address behavioral health needs across the entire age continuum. So while we're focused on K-12 today, we're, um, we certainly support um, from, from birth all the way up. So, and when we speak about behavioral health, we feel it's super important to know that we're speaking about both mental illness and substance use disorder. So here are the 10 different regional offices, the um, Health and Human Services, and SAMHSA has two to three uh, team members within each of these offices. And as I indicated, we, lead, we are part of leading the strategic discussions with our state, community, tribal organizations to promote behavioral health, to advance prevention, which is where we'll spend a little time today, the treatment of and recovery from mental and substance use disorders. I think a super exciting part of our work is that we have the opportunity to lead cross agency initiatives that, that is a little bit, I think a little bit easier to manage at the regional level across the federal family. So like the one that we're talking about today with behavioral health and food. Um, so we're excited to both have both CDC's participation today as well as USDA's. If you can go to the next slide. As Cheryl mentioned, there's a lot of investment happening um, in the space of um, investing in children and COVID has given this a, a whole different approach. Um, we at SAMHSA are, are fully in belief that behavioral health is a national priority and the, the, the importance of emphasizing this and integrating this into the whole healthcare portfolio is critical. Uh, the federal government is investing interventions that are preventing the development of behavioral health challenges in, in youth and young adults. SAMHSA has the leadership um, and is providing funding to states and communities to address mental health, substance use treatment and recovery and prevention. 
And this, this includes and kind of looks like infrastructure to support school-based mental health services. There's funding for school staff. There's funding for community members, families, and even student peer-based efforts that are providing training and recognition of mental health problems and supportive interventions. These programs su support the placement of positive environments in school settings to help students engage in pro-social interaction and positive approaches to problem solving. And some of those things you'll hear amplified a little bit today in some of the examples we have from future speakers. Our funding also provides resources to schools to employ behavioral health staff who can help, help address the needs of students in school-based settings, as well as offering direct services for behavioral health concerns um, outside of school settings. So we're super honored to be a part of this discussion uh, with all of you today. Let's hop to the next slide. So as, as you can see, based on the registration below, we've got over 200 folks with us today. Um, incredible. I would love to just take a pause and say uh, 206 to be exact. Uh, thank you so much for everyone's interest, energy, excitement um, about being here. So we want to do our best to try to keep people engaged. We appreciate hearing from 200 leaders, plus it can pose some logistical challenges. Um, we have a couple of great folks working behind the scenes to help ensure that we're keeping track of what's happening in terms of comments in the chat box, questions for our presenters. We want this to be an open dialogue with 200 of your closest friends, and so we're hoping people will share resources, um, kind of ensuring that people have their phones muted when and their microphones muted when other folks are talking. Um, so I'm going to put you up for a little test, your first test. Um, so we invite you to help us set our virtual classroom values today. As we continue to center this work on equity and on justice, we want to really focus the idea of making sure that people have created a setting, even in a virtual capacity, that is inclusive, that is open, that allows people to challenge, to learn, um, certainly um, appreciating there's a need for confidentiality for the conversation today. So we've listed a few here and I would love for folks to take a minute, warm up their morning fingers. And if there are other things that you'd like us to you know, identify and call out in this space so that we can create kind of an open, um, inclusive working environment as we dive into our discussions today, I would certainly welcome that. We've got some some shy folks. <laughs> okay. So let's hop to the to the next slide. So where did this all begin? And I think you know this is, um, a, a you know a really cool part of the story. So I think probably half of the people, if not more, on this call know Andrea Alma. Uh, with USDA Farm to School. She's our uh, strong and mighty farm to school out here in the region. She invited me to join her for lunch at this really cool deli, as you can see pictured here, called Levin, which is here in Denver. Um, very fortuitous of her, I might add, back in September of 2019. And the whole point of just kind of a conversation lunch was to talk about different partnership opportunities across HHS and USDA. So during our conversation, we actually spoke about the desire to explore this connection of food and mental health and how state and community and tribal organizations are kind of working to look at this and address issues specifically in our K-12 population. After our brainstorming meal, Andrea facilitated a call where I had the great privilege to meet Rachel Jones, who's the executive director of Farm to School of Park County in beautiful Park County, Montana. Rachel, along with her incredibly diverse group of partners kind of helping her work behind the scenes, have, has really thoughtfully baked social and emotional supports and different learning strategies into their farm to school program. And quite frankly, it's I think it's a best practice, especially for how we function in, in the rural parts of our, our states. And it's actually what inspired us to dive into this, to see what others were doing. So we're super thankful to learn not only from part, people like folks leading initiatives in Park County and her team members, but then also all of you that we've taken an opportunity to have a conversation with over the course of the last six to nine months in our planning and trying to just get familiar with this work. Um, really a special shout out to Park, Park County for helping us name this town hall today, Food and Mood. That was certainly um, their brainchild, so thank you. Since Andrea's USDA region covers both SAMHSA's regions, as, as uh, Cheryl and I have both indicated, uh, we invited Kim Reynolds to join into our discussion. It's kind of how we landed with all of you from across the 10 states and tribes across these um, two regions. Let's go hop to the next slide. All right. 
So I think as I was planning my remarks for why we were here today, I got thinking about this and thought, you know, the best, I think the best place to find this would be addressed by you, you all. So I went back and looked through the list of the participants and on the slide here, you're going to see a handful of them. There's 200, 200 of them that I couldn't include on a slide in order to pass PowerPoint 101. But the ones that are reflected here, a lot of the messages that I called out here in red really resonated through um, other people's registrations of why they felt like they wanted to come spend a little bit of time with us um, in a virtual setting. So I, I really, I wanna emphasize on a couple of these here. There were a lot of folks, again, really centered on the justice and the equity space of food and food being a basic human right. Uh, we are super fortunate to have folks on from the National Farm to School Network um, who at the leadership top down are doing an incredible job of really highlighting an important, the importance of this. So if there are folks on who don't know the Farm to School Network, I highly encourage you taking a minute to pull them up and take a look at their organization are just doing some incredible work in this space. We're looking, we have folks on from local farmer community, from the farming communities. We have growers participating on this. We have food banks who have really extended their scope of services to, to be what we're titling kind of ancillary service providers um, to really ensure that when folks are coming in for services that we're treating and supporting the whole human and not just the one individual item that they're coming in the door for. Um, so, Let's head to the next slide. And here we're gonna we're I'm gonna draw your attention to the chat box, and there's gonna be a poll. Um, my colleague is gonna put this in the chat box right now, and we really just want to know a little. I this I feel like this is the part that gave me kind of the the energy and the excitement about the call today. I'd like to invite you all to just enter and tell us a little bit more about you. We're just looking. I think you can opt, enter more than one option. Um, and we'd love to hear uh, a little bit about where you're calling in from. Take it away, Andrea. Or Jen, there's the poll. So the Tracy, poll is Jen, in the box. If you could, and, and Jen, if you could um, hand over sharing to me, actually, um, we're gonna do the mentee, Jen, not the, not the poll. Um, thanks, all right. Perfect. Okay. So if folks wouldn't mind uh, clicking on that link, you can choose more than one of the areas of the field that you are engaged in currently and are, looks like folks have found their way to it. Um, wow, we have a lot of different elements of this field represented on the call is what I'm seeing um, right now. Food security, food access and education and nutrition are leading the way. Um, But we have a lot of folks rep representing other elements of this intersectional uh, topic. We've got, you know, substance abuse, or misuse prevention, farm to school, public health. We'll give another minute or so here for folks to, to chime in. Still see we've had, we had, we've had over 100 folks um, jump in already. The numbers are ticking up. <laughs> Um, I just want to mention Thanks, uh, ask a quick question, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so Andrea, you're in charge of the Park County Farm to School, is that right? I am not. Uh, Rachel Jones is. Uh, she's on the call, and so feel free to find her in the chat and chat her directly, and oh, okay. I will be presenting about Farm to School, and we'll include a little bit more on their model later on in the presentation, too. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, you bet. All right, I think we're going to close it Good. off here. Thanks, folks, for chiming in uh, with your um, areas in the field. Again, it's really great to see so many folks working on so many different elements of food and mood. Thanks so much, Andrea. And Emily, thanks for calling out the fact that we miss child welfare here. I think that's a really important piece to obviously the puzzle, both in the school system, but also in the behavioral health spectrum. So uh, lesson learned from us. We hope that you'll still want to carry on and work on this space with us and to make sure that we have all of the vital partners and the voices included at the table. So thank you uh, for taking a pause to do that. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Kim. She's going to kind of give a highlight of where we're heading for the rest of the day and look forward to conversations with you all in the chat. Great. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kim Reynolds, and I'm the Assistant Regional Administrator for SAMHSA's Region 7, which includes the states of Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska, as well as nine, uh, nine tribes. 
I want to again remind everyone that this town, town hall is being recorded. We're fortunate to have a large number of participants joining us at today's town hall. And you know, it's a number that's too large to make individual introductions. However, we'd like for you to have a sense who's at the meeting with you. So if everyone would take a moment to complete the poll that I think is gonna be, there it is, um, and tell us um, what type of organization you're with. And so we have a, a really diverse group of folks with us today, as we've, as we've talked about, um, from many different types of organizations. If you'd like to learn more about the par participants or are looking for folks who might want to collaborate with you, uh, there's a handout that we're going to put in, in the chat titled Food and Mood Participant List. And that was also sent as part of the reminder for today's meeting. It can be found. Um, with the, with the chat, as well as other handouts like today's agenda, um, a couple of, uh, of uh, research articles that are, are related to today's topic. Um, all of this, these uh, attachments are also going to be included in a follow-up email to you after the town hall. So as you can see from our agenda that we have a number of speakers scheduled for today. And so we encourage you to ask questions of our speakers, but to do so by posting them in the chat. Um, if you're calling into the webinar, please email any questions that you may have to me, Kimberly.Reynolds at SAMHSA.HHS.gov. That's K-I-M-B-E-R-L-Y dot R-E-Y-N-O-L-D-S at SAMHSA.HHS.gov. One topic of the intersection between behavioral health and food slash food insecurity slash school gardens in the K through 12 population, our, our topic is a broad and complex one. We recognize that there are many issues within it that we aren't able to cover in a two hour town hall, such as behavioral health and food allergies, illnesses, gut health, uh, eating disorders, special considerations with regard to children with serious emotional disturbances. We also acknowledge and understand that there are social and structural inequities that impact school aged children, youth and their families and their relationships to food and their behavioral health. However, for us and we hope for many of you, today's town hall is just the first in a series of conversations that we're going to have together about these and many other topics. We'll be reaching out to you after today to discuss how you'd like to remain involved. And we'll be asking you after participating in the town hall, what ideas you have about ways to make traction in this space through group work and other collaborative strategies and about what you wanna hear more about and how you'd like to receive that information. What we'd like to invite you to do today is to listen for what resonates, to make this a truly interactive event by asking questions in the chat and participating in the polls and to be thinking about how you wanna be involved in the future. Finally, Tracy and I would like to take a moment to recognize a few participants who join us from SAMHSA. We wanna thank our regional administrators, Dr. Charles Smith and Kimberly Nelson, without whose support and encouragement, we would not be here today. As well as Dr. Ada Balsano, who is the special assistant to the director of SAMHSA's Center of Su for Substance Abuse Prevention. Prior to her work with SAMHSA, Dr. Balsano provided national leadership in social sciences research, education, and extension programs at the USDA. We also want to thank all of you for taking the time to join us this morning. So our first speaker today is Valerie Kolick. Valerie is the special assistant to the director of the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs at SAMHSA. Valerie has been working with SAMHSA for 10 years in the Community Mental Health Block Grant Program and then in policy, working with the regional offices and the Advisory Committee for Women's Services. Additionally, she's worked on special projects with the President's Council on Sports, Fitness and Nutrition and university partners to develop research and training around nutrition and behavioral health. Prior to SAMHSA, Valerie worked with the Federally Qualified Health Center Program 
at the Health Resources Services Administration. So take it away, Valerie. I guess I should unmute myself. Thank you, Kim. I'm gonna share my screen and uh, pull up my slides here. So welcome everyone. I'm excited for this. It's definitely been something I've been interested in for a long time. So I'm excited to start having these conversations. All right, let me know in the chat if you can't see my slides for some reason. So every morning I woke up to get my clothes on, to get myself to the bus stop, looking for something to eat, but running out of time as I ran to catch the bus before it left. I got to school, I put on a happy face, yet I was dreading every moment. I sat in the first class and could barely keep my eyes awake and my head kept drooping down. Embarrassed when the teacher would call me out for pulling asleep. I wanted to do better, I wanted to learn, but I just couldn't. I would run to the vending machine and grab the quarters out of my pocket and grab a soda and a Snickers bar, hoping the sugar would help me stay focused. And it did for a little until the sugar crash happened. My mind started spinning and I couldn't focus on what my teacher was saying. Everyone, everything just felt really foreign to me. I would think like, I'm so stupid. What's wrong with me? Why can't I learn this? My teachers just said I wasn't trying. Honestly, I didn't think anyone cared. I sometimes would just go home and sit in front of the TV, eating chips and cookies until I started to feel something, to feel full, to feel something. Often at nighttime, my heart would race and I felt it beating out of my chest. I never knew what it was, but I hated this feeling. I worried, I would worry about everything and I hated that I had to go back to school again tomorrow, wondering if I would ever be good enough or smart enough to make it through. Now, this is not my story, but this is a story of the 38 million children living with mental illness and the one in six children living in poverty right now in the US. Many of them are feeling anxious, depressed, unable to focus and learn and not getting the support or the help that they need. 56.8% of these children and youth with mental illness do not get any services. And prior to the pandemic, we know that one out of six children had a mental illness, one out of six. We know that one out of seven adolescents aged 12 to 17 had a major depressive disorder or episode, an increase of 700,000 over a four year period. We also know that suicide is the second leading cause of death for youth between the ages of 15 and 24 years of age. And chances are things are not gonna be getting better anytime soon. Chances are there are gonna be more and more children with mental illness and the numbers will continue to rise. Because in the words of Christine Bethy, a professor at John Hopkins School of Public Health, we are sitting in a tsunami of trauma. In the last year, we have gone through unprecedented times, a pandemic that flipped our lives upside down, taking physical connection and comfort out of our lives, natural disasters across the nation, social unrest, and a political environment that has torn us apart. And we can't forget all the tensions that arose between friends and family who are arguing back and forth on social media about who they would nominate. Would it be Joe Exotic or Carol Baskins to be the new Tiger King? But in all seriousness, one lesson that I believe everyone has taken from 2020 is to focus on what's truly important. And that's why we're here today, to focus on the health and future of our children. Today, we join together in the Zoom, which has become way too familiar over the last year. In this virtual room of faces, we have change makers from the Department of Education, schools and nutrition, tribes, po public policy offices, school administrators, public health agencies, behavioral health agencies, Department of Agriculture, child welfare and behavioral health and nutrition experts. We are together here for one common purpose. In the words of Alicia Ellingsworth, one of the participants here and the director of the Farm to School at Kansas City Farm, to Farm School program said, creating a tomorrow better than today. And we can only do that as a community. And I think we'll all agree with what Jamie Haberl, another participant here today and the executive director at Iowa Healthy Estate Initiative said, kids are the future of our nation 
Therefore, we must support building healthy lifestyles to ensure long-term success. And one way we can do that is to create communities that wrap our children and youth in supports, services, and factors that will help to protect them from the adverse effects of today's traumas. Things like creating communities where all children and youth have the support of caring adults, where we teach parents how to be more resilient, where we help these kids cultivate purpose, create social connections, and improve the socioeconomic, emotional, and physical health of our children. And what better way to do that than through food? So let's consider this. Do you remember growing up, going to pick strawberries at a farm with your family? Or maybe you take your children now. I know this was one of my favorite memories. I vividly remember these trips with my parents, these trips of gathering the healthy food that we could bring home to our family. Or think about the last family or family dinner or cookout that you had, which for most of us was way too long ago standing around, cooking and chatting together, smelling all the sweet aromas of the food, laughing and creating community. Or just recently, the excitement I had when I grew my first basil plants. <laughs> and I do not have a green thumb, so this was a big deal for me. And I got to use that basil plant to provide some nutritious food for my family. Food can be a vehicle for social change. It brings people together in a way that very few other activities can, by Anand Still. Throughout this town hall, you'll hear how food can bring our communities together and wrap our children in health and hope. Through programs like the Whole School, Whole Community, Whole Child Model that supports children's social and emotional health, and the communities and schools of Mid-America who help students in poverty receive the supports, the nutrition, and a system of caring adults and the farm to school program that helps students gain access to healthy local foods, cultivating a sense of purpose through school gardens, cooking lessons and strengthening the local economy and the communities. And now countless research is showing that nutrition and food is a protective factor of mood as well. One protective factor that we rarely talk about because the science is so new is the vital role nutrition plays in our children's mental health and wellness. Because we all know this intuitively, right? I mean, you know how you feel when you grab a Diet Coke and some chips as an afternoon snack. Maybe a little on edge, maybe lethargic, unable to focus. Maybe like the doggy in this picture, isn't he cute? Um, how do you feel when you down that double cheeseburger and fries from McDonald's? Tired, too full to do anything. You can't think, you can't focus. And then how do you feel when you eat a big green salad loaded with veggies and a fresh oil and vinegar dressing? Refreshed, you feel good, you're focused, your body feels comfortable. We know that food affects the way our body feels and the serious physical health consequences of filling our bodies with crap foods like sodas, trans fats, processed foods. So if food is having this effect on our body and everyone here knows the mind brain and body connection, how aren't we looking more at how food is affecting our mental health and our moods? More importantly, we're overlooking the importance of nutrition on the behavioral health moods, learning and the cognitive abilities of our children. So we only have, you know, 10 minutes. So I'm just gonna top level this with what we know about nutrition and the brain. Research shows that ADHD, autism, depression, anxiety, and many other mood disorders are, and even substance use disorders are linked to a lack of neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, GABA, and noradrenaline. And micronutrients and minerals are a key factor in developing these neurotransmitters. And some of these neurotransmitters such as serotonin are actually produced in the gastrointestinal tract. So that food is directly impacting us. So what we eat is essentially feeding our brain. And when we don't feed our brain the minerals and macronutrients it needs, it can lead to greater problems such as low energy, lack of focus, ADHD, anxiety, depression, and other mood disorders. We know that trans fat, sugar, and carbs actually decrease the BDNF, the brain-derived neurotrophic factor in our brains. And this is the gene responsible for neuron growth in the brain. So low BDNF is also linked to depression. 
And we wonder why our kids can't focus or actually learn new things in school when they're not getting the correct nutrients and uh, minerals in their diet. And there's still some inconclusive evidence, but it, it's getting stronger that certain foods such as sugar, trans fat, vegetable oils, refined carbs, alcohol, processed meat cause inflammation in the body to the extent that it affects the brain and the neurotransmitter function, which may also be linked to depression and anxiety. There are studies that show that inadequate amounts of N3 essential fatty acids, also you probably know this is omega-6, vitamin B12, magnesium, and zinc have been associated to depression. And increasing these nutrients may actually prevent or treat certain types of depression. And then a lack of magnesium, zinc, vitamin B, C, and E are linked to anxiety. And again, balancing and increasing these nutrients may help in preventing or treating anxiety. Here's the standard American diet, i.e. the SAD diet. The SAD diet only provides a small portion of the micronutrients and minerals that we need for healthy cognitive functioning. The lack of the good stuff and the overabundance of the bad stuff, the trans fats, sugars, and simple carbs is a disaster for the health of our brains, leading to lack of focus, lack of cognitive development, and many mood disorders. Now, when there's a lack of nutrients compounded by the stress and trauma that each of our children are facing today, it creates even more imbalances in the brain. So nutrition isn't the solution, but it is a huge part of the solution. So what do we need to do differently? Let's take a look at some of the nutrients that our brain needs to stay healthy. I provided you all as well. I think if, uh, Jennifer, if you can put that in the chat, I provided you with a one pager that shows some of the brain healthiest food. We look at some micronutrients. It's already in the chat. Oh, thanks, Frank. Um, N3 essential fatty acids. There's tons of research on essential fatty acids and the effect on preventing and even treating depression and anxiety. And you can optimize mood stability and cognitive function with foods like fish, chia seeds, walnut seeds, and seaweed. Uh, vitamin T, D, wow. Vitamin B12, which is critical brain nutrient. And limited intake can actually lead to um, mental illnesses. There's vitamin B, which helps to produce energy needed to develop new brain cells. Vitamin C plays a role in the uh, differentiation and the maturation of neurons and in the formation of the myelin sheath. And this basically protects um, impulse transmission, making vitamin C really crucial to cognitive performance. And then vitamin D is responsible for serotonin production and supports growth of new brain cells. Low levels of vitamin D are associated with memory loss. And then vitamin E is an important antioxidant that primarily protects cells from damage associated with oxidative stress. And we also have some minerals. Magnesium acts as the gateway for a NMDA receptors, which are involved in the healthy brain development, memory, and learning. Zinc maintains the integrity of DNA that helps the brain direct all cellular activities. And potassium is the electrolyte that is the break for the central nervous system. Low potassium can lead to anxiety, worry, resentlessness. Restlessness, sorry. And a Mediterranean diet is a great example of a brain healthy diet. Compare that next to our SAD diet, and it's easy to see where we are going horribly wrong. The fact that what our, our children are currently eating and what we're currently eating is actually hurting our brains instead of nourishing our bodies and brains. And I know it's a super important topic as well for the one in six American children living in poverty who aren't even sure where their next meal is coming from, trying to get these healthy foods on their plate as well. So no wonder our kids are struggling so much. No wonder mental illness is on the rise. And as we go through this tsunami of trauma, it's likely to continue to rise. Finding ways we can better educate our children, give them more opportunity to eat and love healthy foods, provide them with better snack and, and food choices in schools is low hanging fruit. Do you like my pun there? 
So in our fight to create better health and wellness for our children. So the research is still very thin as it relates to children and nutrition outside of the ADHD world. But the science is there and we need to start listening to it and seeing how we can do better. So who would like to learn more about this? As I said, we can only cover so much in a couple minute presentation. So at the bottom of the one pager that Frank put in the chat for you, I have given you three additional resources to start inspiring you and educating you further on nutrition and mental health. There's first a journal article, Nutrition and Behavioral Health Disorders, Depression and Anxiety. And I co-authored this article with experts in nutrition and behavioral health from Penn State University, Mayo Clinic, NIAAA, University of Connecticut, and University of California. And it summarizes the recent evidence regarding the role of diet and nutrition in the prevention and management of depression and anxiety. Then using the science in this paper, we worked with the University of Arizona, the Western Region Public Health Training Center to create a free online training program to help, to help health educators, nurses, dietitians, and behavioral health providers incorporate the science of nutrition into the treatment and prevention of depression, anxiety, and substance use disorder. It's free. All you have to do is uh, go to the link that I gave you and create an account and you can enroll in the course. And finally, the SAMHSA Center of Excellence for Eating Disorders. This is not something that we're gonna, we've touched on today, but I wanted to make sure that you know about this. This is a center funded by SAMHSA to provide high quality training and resources to help professionals, educators, and individuals around eating disorders. So you have a great place to start this journey in your community. And we still must remember we're going through the tsunami of trauma and looking at what it is and looking at what is on the plates of our children and youth is one big part of the equation. And when we can build a community of health, supports and hope around this, the world can change. Our children will have a chance because food is not just fuel. Food is about family. Food is, food is about community. Food is about identity. And when we nourish all, and we nourish all of those things when we eat well. This is why I'm really excited to hear the upcoming presentations because they're gonna give us each ideas and opportunities to create thriving communities that create health for our children. It just takes one person sitting in this room, this Zoom room today to say, this is a problem. We've gotta do something about this. I'm not gonna sit back and wait for things to get worse. This takes a cultural shift and change, but nutrition and nourishing our children's brains and bodies is an important first step. If we focus on building a community around our children and youth that includes nutrition and food, we could potentially lower mental illness and substance use. We can build healthy and thriving communities, ensure our children do better academically and socially, and protect our children and youth from the adverse effects of the trauma that we have been through in the last year. So I ask you, as you each listen to these presentations, let your mind and your notebook fill with brilliant ideas, get excited about the endless possibilities presented here and start asking yourself, what's one action I can take to move this forward? So will you be the person to take a stand to start talking to others in your community and start taking action? because all it takes is one good idea to start a revolution and to create change. So will you join me in this group in nourishing our children and youth? Raise your hand in the chat or put it in the chat if, you are, if you'll join us in a community dedicated to wrapping our arms around our children and youth and creating a better, healthier future. Oh, thanks Valerie. Um, so I think we may have time for one quick question for Valerie, but if anybody has additional questions that we don't get to, please do put them in the chat and we'll follow up with you after afterward. Amy, do we have a question? I see one. Um, where would you say the, big, the biggest gaps are in the research and links between nutrition and mental health? Um, there's not a lot of research when it comes to children. There, there is some around ADHD, but not a lot more research around that. There is a lot of research when it comes to omega-3 fatty acids, 
and how that is really helping and supporting moods. moods. Um, and then the link is often correlated. So it's one part of the puzzle, definitely not the puzzle uh, for mental illness specifically and for substance use disorder. Uh, there is a lot of research and it's grown. I started writing the paper uh, four years ago and the research has probably tripled since then. So even what's in that paper is just scratching the surface of what is starting to come our way. So it's exciting what is up and coming and the research that is coming out. Great, thanks Valerie. So our next speaker is Caitlin Merlo. Caitlin is a health scientist with the Centers for Disease Control and serves as the school health branch's lead for school nutrition. She develops science-based guidance and provides co content expertise and technical assistance on strategies to improve the school nutrition environment and support healthy eating among youth. So take it away, Caitlin. Great, thank you so much, Kim, and good morning to everyone. I'm really delighted to be with you all today and to be a part of this conversation around nutrition and how that's linked with behavioral health. Again, my name is Caitlin Merlo. I'm a health scientist and registered dietitian in CDC's Healthy Schools branch, which is located in the Division of Population Health. And I'll be spending the next 15 minutes or so this morning talking about the Healthy Schools program at CDC and how our work is aiming to make connections to support the overall well being of students. Next slide, please. We know from decades of research that health and learning are strongly connected and that healthy students perform better in school. For example, students who are physically active, who eat healthy foods and breakfast regularly and manage their chronic health conditions have improved test scores, better grades, increased school attendance and better classroom behavior. And we're starting to understand more about how these same behaviors are also related to behavioral health outcomes. And this is really an area of growth for us at CDC. Next slide, please. We use the whole school, whole community, whole child framework or WISC to guide our work around school health. And some of you may already be familiar with WISC and recognize that it has some of the same components as the older coordinated school health model. One of the main features of WISC is that students are placed at the center of the WISC framework. And this really highlights the need that in order for students to be successful academically, they need to have their basic needs met first. And that is that they are safe, they feel engaged, supported, that they're challenged, and that they're healthy. And we can accomplish this by coordinating policies and practices across the 10 components in blue. These blue components include health education, physical education and physical activity, the nutrition environment and services, health services, counseling, psychological and social services, the social and emotional climate, the school's physical environment, employee wellness, family engagement, and community involvement. And rather than addressing each of these components individually, we really aim to make connections across components and support schools in implementing policies and practices that promote student well being academically, socially, emotionally, and physically. And this is really at the heart of our conversation today and making connections between adequate access to sufficient and nutritious food and how that can affect behavioral health outcomes. The other thing that I'm hoping that we can keep in mind throughout our conversation today is how we can leverage local school wellness policies, which we know are required at the school district level, as a mechanism for addressing students' overall well being. Wellness policies have requirements related to nutrition and physical activity, but these policies can be expanded and adapted to address other components of the WISC framework. Next slide. So while the WISC framework might theoretically make sense to many of us, the challenge then becomes, how do we put it into practice? What does a healthy school really look like? The National Association of Chronic Disease Directors created a great series of short videos that show how WISC works at the school district and school building levels. So I'd like to show one of those videos today. It's about five minutes, and then the link to the rest of the videos in the series is on the slide.
Jennifer, oh, there we go. We may need to pull it up. As being key. At the door, they bring. Open in a different tab, Jennifer. We have to address the needs of the whole child. We want them to leave their problems at the door so many times so that they can come in and they can learn. But the truth of the matter is they can't leave all of their problems at the door. They bring them to the school. And I think the schools are now responsible for trying to make sure that they deal with those issues. By looking at what the research says, it's easy to see that in order to get kids where we want them to be, we have to make sure their basic needs are met. And the WISC approach helps us to be able to do that. I have learned through my time as curriculum director, it's near impossible for us to separate out school from home from community. And so what I love about this model is that it doesn't separate those things out. It, it marries all of those. But I think you certainly need at least one consistent administrator who's there and who's not just there to sign off on it, but who really believes in it. The WISC model helps kids to be more academically prepared, but it also helps them to be happier and healthier within the school. For example, when I talk about breakfast in the classroom, how many more kids come to school on time? How many more kids are here ready for learning? How does that impact their day? That doesn't necessarily correlate into a test score today, but over a long period of time, it helps kids to be more successful. As a superintendent, it really is my responsibility to make sure that the system is functioning in a way that supports students. That there are protocols, that there are um, fiscal allocations, that there's policy in place. And so it really has become a calling of mine to make sure that for my community, health and wellness is at the top of everybody's list. Big ships turn slowly and it takes time for that philosophy and that culture to build. We have been able to meet the needs of students on a health and wellness level, emotional level, physical level, nutrition level, and we haven't gone backwards. Our kids get 45 minutes of physical activity every day. It hasn't impacted their academics negatively. The administrative support is so important because if there's any physical changes that need to take in the building or if you're changing a policy or even changing the lunch time that kids can go outside, administration has to be involved. I feel very fortunate that we've had strong administrative support definitely supporting the decisions made. What is it that we can provide in terms of background knowledge for the teachers or professional development so that they understand the importance of what we're doing? But the why is a big part of ensuring that you have teacher support. I'm very proud of the fact that from top-down administration, they're very supportive of the whole child, and they really want to see each of the children here supported, however that looks. So I really have, have had the opportunity to look at various resources, uh, go to different trainings, and whatnot. Given the teachers that freedom to navigate and research and find outlets, and I think that it's a mindset. If a teacher is in this mindset of restriction, and I have to follow this mold or this protocol, you're not going to get that creativity, you're not going to get that teacher that's going to take that initiation to go out and find programs. We have teachers who are really into health and wellness, whether it's bringing in a farm to school program at our middle school or uh, planting fruits and vegetables in, in a vegetable garden right on school grounds. And so I think you'll find that you have a lot of staff who are already inspired around this work. Just opening up the world of an educator to see that it's more than just uh, data on a sheet of paper and how much kids are learning. And it's, it's as important to open their eyes to a different way to live that could help them to be healthier throughout their lives. What I like about the WISC model is that it helps me to empower people, see a change in people's lives that happens right in front of me that's bigger than just academics. And we're the ones who have to make the decisions and the choices and take the action that's going to improve the lives of kids. Because 
They're 100% of our future. And we owe it to them to give them the best of our abilities to help them reach their greatest potential. Great, so I hope that that video really helped to illuminate what the WISC framework looks like in action and the amount of support that is needed from many layers within a school system and uh, many individuals. I like how that video um, you know, takes the opportunity to let different voices from across the school um, share about the importance of, of WISC to them and helping to support student well-being. So the Healthy Schools Branch at CDC, it works to help states and districts make the WISC framework a reality. Currently, our goals are focused on physical activity and physical education, health education, nutrition, healthy out of school time policies and practices, management of chronic health conditions, and helping to support and sustain school health infrastructure at the state, district, and school levels. You can see that our goals align with many of the components of WISC, and we're continuing to challenge ourselves and our grantees to implement strategies that link across multiple components of the WISC model. So for example, we're currently addressing the social and emotional climate and social and emotional learning in our work and showing how these topics intersect with our priority areas of nutrition, physical activity, activity and chronic health conditions. Next slide, please. So to achieve these goals, we currently fund 16 states to implement strategies to advance this work. Our funding goes directly to the state education agency, which is different than most of the groups at CDC who typically fund a health department, a state level health de department or local level. Our funding goes directly to the state education agency and all of our grantees have a memorandum of understanding in place with their state health department to help get that work done. Um, each of the states that we fund has selected up to 10 local education agencies or school districts to prioritize working with. And I've highlighted Colorado, Missouri, and Nebraska because those are the states that are in your regions that are currently receiving the CDC funding under this 1801 School Health Cooperative Agreement. And I think that I even saw one of um, our current grantees on the call today, which is great. Next slide, please. So let's take a closer look at our nutrition work within the Healthy Schools branch. Our grantees provide professional development and technical assistance on a comprehensive approach for school nutrition. And they work with prior priority school districts to implement policies and practices that create a school nutrition environment that supports students' health and their learning. This approach considers all of the ways that students have access to foods and beverages during the school day aims to ensure that students see and hear consistent messages about good nutrition at school and that they have opportunities to learn about and practice healthy eating. So under the 1801 cooperative agreement, grantees can work on a very wide range of activities, including farm to school, water access, and nutrition education. And they are, of course, working to revise and implement local school wellness policies that reflect this comprehensive approach to student well-being. Next slide, please. One of our key strategies is to promote access to and participation in the school meal programs. We recognize that USDA is the lead agency for school meal programs and has so many wonderful resources, technical assistance and training materials, but we're really interested in just getting the word out to ensure that students have access to the programs and that they're participating in them. So we recently published a research brief outlining the importance of adequate seat time for school meals. And that is the time that students have to actually eat their meal after they've received it. We've also created tip sheets in both English and Spanish to educate parents and caregivers about the benefits of the school meal programs. And we recently created a communication toolkit to help school districts reach parents and caregivers with messages about school meals and that they are free for all kids for the rest of this school year. Next slide. Another aspect of school nutrition that is starting to get discussed more and more is access to drinking water. We know that adequate hydration is important for cognitive functioning, including attention and memory. 
and that water really is an ideal beverage choice for children, but it can be really overwhelming for schools to take on this complex topic. So we've developed a series of nine short videos that examine a range of topics, including how to ensure that drinking water is safe, how to make free drinking water available throughout the school, how to meet the drinking water requirements that are embedded in the National School Lunch Program and School Breakfast Program, and strategies for promoting water as an ideal beverage choice. Next slide, please. I mentioned earlier that we're always looking for ways to connect the dots between different aspects of the WISC framework, and rather than addressing each component individually. We recently created a brief that links uh, school nutrition, the social and emotional climate, and social and emotional learning. And one of the key takeaways is that the work that schools are doing to improve the school nutrition environment can actually help improve the social and emotional climate and students' social and emotional learning. So for example, we talked about adequate seat time a minute ago. Ensuring that students have adequate seat time for their meals, it gives them not only the opportunity to sit and to enjoy and consume their meal, but also to connect with their peers and that helps to facilitate relationship skills. Nutrition education can help promote self awareness, which is one of the four key, uh, sorry, the five core competencies of social and emotional learning by teaching students how to recognize when their emotions are influencing their eating habits and how to listen to their internal cues about when they're feeling hungry and when they're feeling full. Cooking demonstrations and taste test activities can actually help develop social awareness by allowing students an opportunity in a safe space to try new foods and be reminded that people different, differ in what they like to eat and that's okay. So addressing policies and practices in one area can help address multiple aspects of student well-being. Next slide, please. We also recently published a study examining the link between physical activity, sedentary and dietary behaviors and indicators of mental health and suicide risk. We know that between 13 to 20% of children and adolescents in the United States experience a mental health disorder such as behavioral problems, anxiety and depression, and that poor mental health can affect overall health and can interfere with regular daily activities such as relationships and academic success in schools. So understanding the relationships between modifiable health behaviors and mental health in adolescents could help schools identify strategies that benefit the health and well being of all students. Some of the key findings related to dietary behaviors indicate that students who did not eat breakfast every day compared to students that did were more likely to feel sad and hopeless to have seriously considered suicide and to have attempted suicide. Students who drank soda or pop one or more times daily compared with students who did not were more likely to have attempted suicide and students that drank sports drinks one or more times daily compared with students who did not were more likely to have attempted suicide as well. School health advocates can use these study results to communicate public health messages and help schools to adopt and put into action the policies and practices that promote healthy dietary behaviors, as this can support the mental health of all students in addition to physical health. Next slide, please. So today we've taken a closer look at various aspects of school nutrition and how and discuss the ways that food and nutrition influence student well-being academically, physically, and emotionally. But really when we stop and think about it, food and nutrition can be incorporated into all aspects of the WISC framework. We've created a one pager that provides examples of nutrition within each component of WISC, and I'm sure that we'll come up with more ideas in our conversations today. Next slide, please. So I'm happy to take questions if there if we have some time, but also please do feel free to reach out to me. My email address is on the slide, as well as our Healthy Schools website, where you can find all of the resources that I've shared today and many, many more. I thank you very much for your time and attention. Thanks, Caitlin. I think in the interest of time, we may need to go ahead and move on to the next speaker. And then if people do want to put uh, questions in the chat, we'll make sure to get them to Caitlin or you, or you can email her directly. Great. Thank so you. thanks again. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, 
Melissa Martin. Melissa is the president and CEO of Communities and Schools of Mid-America and has worked in school-based youth and family services at the local, state, and national level since 1999. Her work has included a significant focus on connecting students and families to both emergency and consistent access to sufficient and nutritious food. Melissa has been with Communities and Schools of Mid-America since 2007, and the organization currently serves more than 37,000 K through 12 students in Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Iowa. Thank you, Melissa. I think you're muted still, Melissa. My apologies. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. I appreciate the introduction and um, I am very excited to be here. I am learning right along with everyone else. Uh, my role may be a little bit different than our other presenters today in that I am really bringing the perspective of direct service providers who work on school campuses. Uh, our organization, uh, provide social services on school campuses. We are not educators, uh, but we are really providing a number of the wraparound uh, services that benefit at-risk students uh, in particular. Uh, and I use that phrase knowing that it is uh, fraught, uh, but for shorthand, it meets our purposes uh, today. Uh, so frame our discussion today, I want to share that over the last three years, Communities and Schools of Mid-America has provided food to students and families more than three or close to 300,000 times. And so what do I mean by instances? Um, that is literally the number of times we provided food. Um, it does not mean it is a single item of food. As you can see on this slide with some of the detail, um, often it was pre-packed boxes of food for families. Uh, often it was the funding or arrangement for a trip to the grocery for a family. Uh, certainly uh, provision of bags of food for students um, over weekends or holidays or for families as a whole. And also during this three year period, um, we provided right at 3,300 first time referrals for families to their local community food programs. And in some cases, these families might have been experiencing a, a new level of need. But in many cases, these were families who had been exceedingly reluctant to reach out for support and who through our work, we built enough relationship with them, built enough trust with them that they were finally willing uh, to take advantage of these kinds of programs. Um, and I'll also quickly say, as we talk about our work with food and behavioral health, when we identify the needs that are prevalent on school campuses, uh, and with the families that, uh, with which we work, food insecurity is almost always in the top five needs and typically will be in the top two identified needs, uh, again, for those that we work with. So you'll see here a quick photo, a couple here of uh, food drop-offs. These are pandemic time. So you see the masking uh, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic again one day. Uh, there are more food pickup opportunities at schools and other general locations. Also to frame our work uh, with students and food and behavioral health, I also want to quickly address some assumptions that are very common about food availability for uh, students. And so if you like me, or perhaps many people we know before we may have entered this arena, uh, you may have assumed that a student who is known to have food insecurity issues 
and the school has a food backpack program, you may make the assumption that that student will go home on Friday for the weekend with a food backpack. I was stunned to learn when I was new in this work that that was not necessarily the case at all, that it is not uncommon for example, to have a school with 400 plus students uh, that perhaps 50% of them experience some level of food insecurity and yet only 30 to 40 students might take home a food backpack. And that is solely attributable to the availability of food from the food banks that manage such programs that is available from local food pantries and so forth. So we've got to correct that kind of uh, misassumption to begin with. And a lot of folks also assume that if a student is available, uh, uh, um, sorry, if a student um, is eligible for a free and reduced lunch, that they are receiving the free and reduced lunch. Unfortunately, often not the case. Um, the student may have qualified and completed the paperwork, but data tells us that uh, in their secondary schooling years, they become more and more reluctant to make use of it due to embarrassment and uh, you know, peer issues, wanting to fit in. Uh, and then for other families, they simply may have immigration status issues that they don't want to uh, apply for any kind of service, or they may simply be of the belief that they don't want to make use of government services. So um, in my perspective, our FRL numbers are actually under uh, reported in terms of eligibility. Uh, and then fourth, I think there's an assumption by many who assume that if hunger is an issue, the school has a pantry of some sort. Again, not always the case and certainly the, the uh, quality or the, the ability to provide at a fairly high number, of, uh, high number of distributions may be vastly different. These photos show two different CIS school pantries. You can see that one is limited to a table uh, with some food items stacked on it and, and bread at that point stacked on the floor. Uh, another is beautifully outfitted. Uh, and so it really runs the gamut. And in some cases there is no official food CIS food pantry, but there is food available in our offices. So let's talk a moment about human capital development uh, and the lack of sufficient nutritious food and how that affects children, teens, their behavioral health at school. So for a moment, I ask you to think of yourself as a child who does not know consistent access to food. And then imagine what that says to you as you are growing, both physically and in your emotional development, what does it say to you, to far too many of our children and young people, it says, you're not even worth food. Everyone else gets food. Most people get food. You're not worth food. So let's think a moment then about behavioral health when that kind of thinking is a foundation of how that student sees themselves and the world around them. We do a great deal of work um, at our, in our school programs to help students and their families, because often their families are the same little guys just grown up. Uh, we do a great deal of work to support them in understanding that they do have a place in this world, that they do have value. And so consequently, uh, we focus a lot on first 
making certain they have access to sufficient food that is nutritious as possible, and then helping in our services, helping them as they are helping them increase their sense of self-esteem, their sense of worth, their sense of value, their sense of being deserving of the same rights and opportunities as other people that they see in the world. Uh, we do a lot of work in that regard. And we see that with the children, the students that we work with in the behavioral health um, arena, that keeping them fed, keeping them fed uh, is a profound indicator of whether or not their school behavioral performance will improve. Many of these kids are sitting in a classroom, second period. They ate their free breakfast as soon as they got to school. They likely had a snack provided by CIS not long after that. Uh, they're sitting now in second period they know they're going to get their lunch. They know they're likely going to get an afternoon snack. And they're still already very worried about how much they'll eat that night, about whether they'll eat that night, about what they'll eat that night. It is impossible for that child to sit in that class and learn, first of all. And in some cases, it is impossible for that child to manage their behavior when they're in the first grade or in the 10th grade and they've had very little social capital built into their lives. So we provide food, we work hard. I want to make a special note to say that we also try to provide not only food, but nutritious food and beyond that, uh, culturally relevant food. That has risen more and more uh, in our awareness of how we should be providing food to those that we serve. And you've also heard several people call out uh, the need for water. And I want to echo that. Um, our site coordinators, what we call our on-campus staff, have repeatedly talked about the fact that they see students exhibiting um, symptoms of dehydration as much as they do hunger. So we also um, make water um, available in the same way that we do food, both at the school and to take home. Um, since I want to make the best use of our time, I'll quickly say that in the students we work with on the behavioral health front, um, every year, more than 80% of those students uh, who have an identified need to improve their behavioral performance at school do so. And I can directly attribute that in part and in large part to um, consistent access to food. I have often uh, wondered if we might simply provide food uh, in, as, as not our other services and how close we might come to similar outcomes because food seems to be so critical to the population that we work with. Uh, we use food as engagement in almost every activity we do, whether it's with students, parents, or community members. I will call myself out for using a photo that shows sugary treats here on the left. Uh, that is a one-time type thing. Typically, it is not our norm uh, in providing food. So I apologize for that oversight. But food as engagement is critical, uh, both to the student work and to the family work. And in some cases, there is food-related bonding uh, to a degree that you would not expect. Young woman whose photo is shrouded here is a student who at 16 years old, when she came into our program, for the first time in her life experienced consistent access to food. And through that, I will say that she bonded with our staff person 
almost to the degree that an infant bonds with a food providing parent. Uh, it was extraordinary. And while that was the first time I individually had seen that, it was not the first or only time that we had seen that in our organization's work because the need is so profound. And when we are working with need that profound, we have to remember and perhaps even take a stand. A child's access to sufficient food, to sufficient nutritious food is a justice issue. The three students, CIS students you see on this screen deserve to eat nutritious food of a sufficient quantity every single day, as do the millions of students in this country who experience food insecurity do. So with that, I will stop here. And again, don't know how time is running, Kim. Happy to take any questions uh, now or later. And I thank everyone for their attention. Thank you very much, Melissa. And I see a number of questions. I think we have time for a couple. Rudy, do you have any you want to ask first off? Yes, I have one here. Um, let me get back to it. Um, How can interested fam parents um, and families work their work with their school districts to make changes if administrators are resistant to change, especially for schools that only have capacity to heat and serve food? Well, it, it really is a it's a community issue and the best that I think I can offer quickly is to say uh, be loud and long. And you can be loud and long uh, in a very constructive way, but don't ask or suggest once and then go away. Don't take a quick, I'm so sorry, we don't have the capacity for more as the final answer to a one-time asked question. I think that, you know, when schools are not located in high poverty areas, when they've got pockets of poverty within their school, I think there is an, a, a particularly acute lack of awareness of the level of need that some of the students are experiencing. So no matter the, the environment in which the school sits, you've just got to be heard. Keep going back, keep asking the questions, keep marshalling uh, community forces. Thanks, Melissa. I think we have time for one more. And then I, I see a number of questions. We'll be glad to, to get those on to Melissa. Rudy, do you have another? Yeah. Um, could you speak to strategies that support sharing the important information here regarding food and mood with the right people that improves the quality of emergency food in schools and otherwise in support of our families and communities? Mm -hmm. Um. I think you've got to take the information to your school board. Um, ultimately, while depending on the district, you know, some are decentralized, some are centralized, but at the end of the day, it is the school board who drives much, if not all, of the policy in the school of the policies in the schools. So first, making certain that your school board is well versed with this kind of information, that they have received it from a number of sources uh, or that you're providing information from a number of sources. Uh, you can make certain every you know, school board has that public comment. Have someone, even if it's just one two minute comment at every school board meeting, have someone making it, don't let it get overlooked provide the critical information. And, you know, my experience is once people are truly aware, they want to help, they want to see things done better. Great, thank you, Melissa. Yeah. So our last speaker is Andrea Alma. Andrea is the USDA Farm to School Regional Lead for the Mountain Plains region based in Denver, Colorado. Prior to joining the USDA, Andrea was the farm to school coordinator for Minneapolis Public Schools. Her career began in Washington, DC, where Andrea founded and directed the DC Farm to School Network. So Andrea. 
Thank you so much. Uh, it's such a pleasure to talk with everyone today. Um, I am certainly not an expert in this space. I've learned so much on our call thus far. I've gotten tingles a number of times, which is always a good sign, you know, that this is deep, deep work and it's it's really exciting. So thanks for sticking with us. Um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about farm to school and how it relates to food and mood. And, and I call it local food and mood because um, here at farm to school, we're all about local. Um, and let's get, get started here. So what is farm to school? Um, there are a lot of different ways to define it, but I'm gonna use a method called the three C's, which was first coined by Vermont Feed, a nonprofit organization. Farm to School aims to get local food into classrooms, so using local food as an educational tool. It aims to get local food into cafeterias, so serving local food in school meals and snacks. And it aims for local food to be a connection point to the community. And, you know, school gardens fit squarely in the middle of all three C's because they can provide food to the cafeteria, they can certainly be a classroom in themselves, and they really tend to engage community members. And, you know, when we're talking about food and move and the linkages to behavioral health, farm to school can be an example of that, but I think it's also kind of a, a microcosm of how we can bring together a whole bunch of interdisciplinary elements uh, into one cohesive project or program. You know, a lot of farm to school folks think of things from an ecosystem perspective, from a whole community, whole child perspective. And, you know, when, when, I, when I was asked to come and talk about this here today, I'm not an expert in the studies and, and, and I've really learned a lot about that from our fellow speakers. I'm going to just present you with a number of case studies or examples of how programs are creatively using um, those behavioral health and mental health elements in their farm to school programming. A lot of them are actually on the call. So I wanna give a shout out to all the wonderful farm to school folks I'm seeing and the great questions that are coming in. And I wanted to send a thank you out to all the folks who I reached out to to, to, to um, share their case studies here today. I'm sure I'm probably missing some of the details because I'm gonna go through them really fast. And so I apologize for any details I'm, I'm misconstruing or missing, but I hope you get a really good idea of how, how this all looks. And, and gardens, gardens are so critical to food and mood work, they're magical. And so I wanted to just invite folks uh, in the chat, if you do any work with gardens in this space, would you mind just chatting it in for us and, and let's get some stories rolling in the chat box. Okay. So before I get, begin, I do wanna say that the Farm to School program was created at USDA in 2010 in the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act or, or otherwise known as the Richard, Richard B. Russell School Lunch Act. And we were tasked to provide grants, conduct training and technical assistance and conduct research and, and, and observe best practices in this space. So that is where Farm to School began was through a congressional act in 2010. And, and these three elements are really what um, the team, myself included, do on a day-to-day -day basis. So the exam examples I'm gonna give to you right now fall into three different buckets. I'm gonna share with you some local level on the ground farm to school programs, implementing those three C's. I'm gonna share with you some state and regional organizations who largely help out those state and lo you know, local level programs. So they're the folks kind of providing training and, and, and assistance to those local level programs. And then I'm gonna share some examples of some national or, or, or tribal organizations that kind of do some really high level coordination work. And, and so at these different levels, I'm going to give you some food, local food and mood examples. So here, here are the examples I'm going to go over and uh, I'm going to let kind of a picture be worth a thousand words here as I, as I go through. So this is what started it all. Farm to School of Park County, uh, they coined the term food and move, mood. We've heard them on, on, uh, on the call a few times here. And let's see, I saw Rachel, Todd, and Barbara on the call. 
Um, if you haven't already, could you please just chat a little high so folks can see um, the, 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 the three kind of brainchild, you know, folks who really coined this, this, um, this term. While they maintain that they're in the beginning stages of doing this work, Farm to School Park County is really deliberately incorporating social and emotional learning, you know, mindfulness, um, you know, peaceful spaces, these types of concepts in their farm to school programming. They're making a deliberate uh, attempt to make sure that all farm to school Park County staff are quote unquote literate in the food and mood space, right? So have a, a, a basic understanding of it. And they're really exploring um, evaluation. We all know what you measure gets done. They want to weave elements of food and mood into the, the, the objectives that they're trying to accomplish and, and measuring their success in accomplishing those objectives. So again, reach out to um, um, Todd, Rachel, and Barbara if you have specific questions. And thank you to you three for your pioneering uh, work in this space. All right, I have another example from Montana as well, Frenchtown School District. Um, Frenchtown High School vocational students have a paid internship in their greenhouse where they're doing a, a pre-employment transitional services program by getting hands-on in not only growing food, but also the whole business aspect of actually selling that food to restaurants and their school cafeteria. So a lot of Montana um, representation here. And there is a, a big emphasis there on life skills and, and kind of, um, you know, the food and mood element is, is present here and not only kind of growing the food that we know nourishes our bodies, but also incorporating kind of a whole child approach to this vocational education program. This is an example from Ferguson, Missouri, the Ferguson Florissant School District. Um, they received an early farm to school grant where they did a summer internship program focusing on culinary skills development for students and actually in the process preserving local food to use in the school cafeteria. Uh, Melissa mentioned relationships. That was a big uh, cornerstone of this effort was building those um, instructor and peer mentorship types of relationships that we know are so critical for, uh, for this work. So a shout out to Ferguson, Missouri. I'm gonna shift gears here now. Those were our local level examples. This is um, kind of a state or regional example. The, the um, Northeast Farm to School Institute is a phenomenal program where teams from different schools can come and learn about farm to school and come up with an action plan for their own school. And I wanted to highlight them because the direction the movement is going is that we know that it's not gonna be one champion who is going to make a farm to school program or for that matter, any sort of whole child program work in a school. It is a team. And, and, and so the Vermont Feeds um, Northeast Farm to School Institute model actually make sure that there's a nurse at the table, a librarian, an art teacher, a school cafeteria personnel, principal administrators, the whole crew to plan out that farm to school program and come up with that action plan because if they're not involved in creating that action plan, it's not, it's not gonna happen. Um, and so I, I wanted to, to highlight this because in the process of planning for farm to school programs, I would say that the movement is is acknowledging and, and walking the walk when it comes to thinking at the program holistically and uh, from all those different elements of the whole child. Okay. I know we have some of our Missouri folks on the line and, and, and the example I'm going to share here is actually funded by some of the opportunities that Caitlin was talking about from CDC. Uh, MOCAN is the Missouri Council for Activity and Nutrition, and they're a multi-agency multi uh, stakeholder group uh, in, involving the Department of Agriculture, you know, the Department of Health and Human Services, even the Alliance of YMCA's, EPA, uh, and they're a partner-driven council that tries to implement and support strategies, policies in particular, to improve health and quality of life for Missouri. Um, 
they have a school work group that, uh, as well as a Missouri Healthy Schools Successful Students Project, both of which are working to assess the needs of schools in the farm to school realm. And they looked at the school health index, the social and emotional climate uh, module, module seven of the school health index, in order to really get a picture of um, where are these schools and how can we design a farm to school program that really meets the school's needs. Um, you know, the, the work of the Healthy Schools Successful Students Project specifically worked with seven priority school districts um, and looked at their school health index, but also um, used a model of self-assessment that I would say has a real whole child, you know, food and mood element to it. So this is one of the questions that just is just an example um, whereby as they're looking at schools and, and trying to engage schools and farm to school, they're not looking just at one element, they're looking at all sorts of different elements of what's going on in that school. And, and I will know Lisa Farmer who, who works on this is, is on the call and she told me that family engagement was a big gap and, and that's something that they're going to be really keeping in mind as they uh, you know, expand their farm to school technical assistance. So. Lisa, would you mind giving out a shout? Yeah, oh, and Lisa, thanks for Mont Feed because this is actually a tool we, we developed from their model. So Lisa put something in the chat. So please be in touch with her if you have questions about this work. I also just saw run by in the chat. I'm sure there were lots of great examples, but I did want to give a shout out to Alicia with the Casey Farm School. She is a current farm to school grantee. Um, and I know she was mentioned by Melissa earlier, or, um, I'm sorry, by Valerie, I think it was right at the beginning of the, the conversation. Small world, huh? Um, this is an example uh, on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation here in our region. And um, this is a partnership between SDSU Extension and a number of local partners that is designed to grow farmers uh, on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, but doing so with a mental health and what's called agribility lens. So looking at, um, make sure I find my slides here, um, you know, really address stress-related mental health disorders, depression, I, you know, due to isolation and the harsh weather climate um, and the economic hardships that are, that are faced on the reservation, actually designing culturally appropriate mental health services and assistive technologies to help people meet their farming goals. And, and I'm relating this to farm to school because I've been in touch with this, this, this group of partners because they want to do more with farm to school, but they need more farmers. They need more food. That is the bottleneck that they identified as they were looking to expand farm to school efforts. And so by focusing on addressing the mental health issues of burgeoning farmers, um, they're going to get us to a robust farm to school program. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about some national organizations. The School Garden Support Organization Network has some fantastic resources, webinars, et cetera, for folks who support school gardens. And I just wanted to give a shout out to a recent webinar they had, which was focused on um, designing garden education to support English language learners. They're looking at the needs of children, you know, that they're bringing to their garden, you know, that the children bring to the gardening space and really providing tools for providers to meet those needs. So English language learning being one of those. And, you know, the, they, they pulled in um, Life Lab, which is a phenomenal nonprofit organization in the garden education space to do this presentation and which really focus on creating emotionally safe learning environments for uh, students, and, and, and again, welcoming ELL students and, and catering to their unique needs as children. I wanted to highlight another uh, grantee, farm to school grantee from actually a couple of years ago. Uh, the Intertribal Agricultural Co Agriculture Council hosted a Youth in Food and Agriculture Great Lakes uh, Summit. And this was a summit for emerging youth leaders in native food and agriculture. 
And uh, it really focused on, on providing youth with immersive experiences in, in cultural and traditional foods um, to prepare these young leaders for uh, to, to kind of take over the movement, quite frankly. And again, this was similar to what Melissa was talking about, about relationship building um, with elders and experts in this area. Uh, there was a lot of, again, mentorship opportunities. And, um, you know, I, I think I think bringing this cultural and traditional lens to farm to school, it, it's an example of how farm to school programs might have three C's, but those three C's are going to look different depending on the cultural and traditional heritage or, 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 or um, you know, your own spin as a community to the work. I wanted to wrap up here and say that uh, a number of the folks stories who I shared were funded by USDA farm to school grants. Um, you know, perhaps you've heard of this grant opportunity, but it th this grant opportunity is so broad that your food and mood work in the farm to school space could likely be funded uh, through this through this grant. So I wanted to highlight this uh, and put it on folks's radar. I'll share a link in the chat to um, the grant opportunity. And I just wanted folks to please uh, reach out in the chat right now. If you have participated in a farm to school grant project, either if you've received a grant or perhaps one of the partners you've received that you've uh, worked with has received a farm to school grant grant. So please, please uh, give a shout out in the in the chat if you've worked on or, 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 or a partner on a farm to school grant. Oh, hi, Jesse. Great. Oh, and Deb, uh, Sharon. Hello. Okay, wonderful. Thanks for chiming in, folks. Um, Andrea, while we're waiting for that, we do have one question that kind of fits in with this, if you don't mind. Absolutely. I'm, I'm all done. My, my contact info is here. Please don't hesitate to reach out. And yeah, let's, let's have a few questions. Okay, this first one is, how do we find out how much money we need for a farm to school program when applying for a grant? That's a great question. Uh, what I think I'll do in the chat is share with you some of the um, action planning tools that are available in the farm to school space that encourage you to sort of pull a team together and do some real thinking and planning around what your farm to school program sh can look like uh, and therefore what sorts of funding opportunities you might need to look at what, what, what um, kind of the price tag might be. Thank you. And then this next question is, um, are farm to table efforts being promoted within public housing developments? And moreover, are there food and mood resources to support this population who are considered disenfranchised and underserved? That's a phenomenal question. Um, I know that nationally our, our, our Office of Community Food Systems, which houses our farm to school program, is having conversations with, um, with HUD uh, to actually discuss that topic. I personally offhand don't have a ton of examples to share, but I am sure that they exist. Uh, if, if others in the chat wouldn't mind chiming in, if, if perhaps you've seen some of these partnerships in the farm to school space with, with, um, with housing, um, thank you for raising that. Uh, I, I wish I had some better examples offhand, but I will say that it's something that I know is on the radar of our national office, and I will, I'll, I'll ping them again to, to let them know that folks are in, interested in that space. Thank you. you know, I think we have time for one more question if you've, if you've got another. It looks like this one might be a question here. Um, related to farm to school grants, just to clarify, it supports the development um, there, not existing programs. Is that correct? So actually, farm to school grants can support both planning for your farm to school program, as well as implementing an existing program or expanding an, an existing program. So if you have a project in mind, 
for expanding your existing program that could very well fit into a grant opportunity. So both planning and implementation. Great. Thank you, Andrea. And again, if you have it, questions that we haven't addressed, we will be getting back to you after the town hall. So that's that's all the time that we have for our speakers today. Now, Tracy Pohl is gonna come back and talk about um, next steps and our final thoughts. Wow, okay. <laughs> um, 190 of you have stuck with us. So thank you. Um, I'd like to just take a quick pause and if folks wouldn't mind doing a chat or a clap um, for our incredible speakers today. I think we, um, if we haven't blown your minds or filled them up uh, with lots of possibilities, um, just alone following the chat was uh, invigorating and overwhelming at the same time. So thank you um, for all of our speakers, for the energy, uh, the leadership in the chat has just been really remarkable. Um, and as Kim indicated, we're planning to get with all of the speakers and ensure every single question has an answer and that will be shared along with the slides, along with all of the incredible content in the chat. Um, our goal is within a week from today, essentially. So, um, but in addition to that, we, as we indicated on the invitation that went out, the goal was to essentially have, was to present today with a couple of models and what we had been hearing over the course of the year leading up to today and wanted to kind of dive in and develop some action items and see who wanted to, to dig into this with us a little bit. So before you, before you leave us, stick with us for just a few minutes. We're gonna, um, I'm gonna ask my colleague to enter um, in the chat right now. Um, we're asking, we're gonna, I, we're gonna have you guys reflect a little bit and kind of tell us, um, Rudy, are you, I think you're queuing that up. Um, what kind of opportunities you see for making progress in this space? Um, and as folks are kind of entering in um, what that looks like, thanks Rudy, I see that that's in there. Um, I wanna just call out a few high level things that I heard today consistently across all of the speakers and again, echoed in the chat box. One, the first one that was really pretty high level was this kind of need for training and education at, and in a leadership space, specifically, I was, I'm, I'm using the literacy piece that I think Melissa hit on, the idea of food and mood literacy um, and, and what that means and calling that out and actually thinking about things like food dignity and eliminating stigma associated with food insecurity and with um, stigma associated with behavioral health, especially when we're talking about it with our communities. Um, another theme that I feel like struck me a bit was several people talked about the importance of building a team and deciding what that team looked like. So whether you're a grantee or whether you're just a really active local community and calling in the right people. And again, it goes back to having your messaging and your literacy to, to be able to grow that team and have that expertise. Um, Priscilla raised the idea with housing authorities. Uh, we had a, somebody call out the idea of, uh, um, uh, child service providers. I, I, you know, I think there's a variety of different folks that should be included at this table um, as you're thinking about how you can navigate this space at your local community level. Um, and then the other, the other piece um, that came up quite a bit in a variety of different arenas was the types of food that we're talking about, both respecting the justice lens of this with access but also the cultural relevance, also our messaging around packaging versus fresh food versus gardening, and really understanding like, do our communities have access to this? Oftentimes with food, it's not simply that someone's not interested in trying or certainly making an effort for this, but there are a lot of other um, blockades along the way to get them to that point of actually doing that. So I, those are some kind of three level, high level things I took away where I feel like the level of um, engagement and expertise in this in this particular community um, really could dive in and you know do some some deep thinking and some deep reflecting on how we could support building something like that if that would be of interest for folks. So I want to kind of call out um, some of the themes that we're, that we're seeing here, and then I think we have um, a, an evaluation question because it wouldn't be. Um, <laughs> a, a federal region presentation if you didn't get an evaluation. Um, I will tell you that you're only gonna be um, uh, given here on the screen the opportunity to answer it. We just really wanna see if we 
if this was helpful, if we've missed the mark, how we can improve. Um, and we also are going to be, in addition to the, the email that's coming out following the meeting, are going to be really calling on you to, um, as Val indicated at the beginning, raise your hand and get involved with us. We, um, we respect and appreciate that some folks are going to take some time to kind of chew on this and figure out where they, how they want to land in this space and what that's going to look like from an active participation standpoint. Um, but we always, we, we are envisioning the idea of having essentially a listserv where we're going to be sharing continuously funding opportunity announcements, trainings to try to get this cross collaboration across agencies to occur just naturally, even if you're just reading about it. Um, but we're going to ask you to commit to what that's going to look like for you all in this follow up email. So uh, be thinking about it. We, the folks who are presenting here today, we offer, you know, some expertise, but most of us are not on the ground delivering this and offering this. And that's really where we feel like um, we'd love to, you know, we'd love to be in a shared space with you navigating these conversations and driving real change. Um, we've had some great discussions about funding. Um, I think there's room for us to think about how we explore language associated with funding. I think there's room to see who's gotten really creative, like Missouri with their funding and blending that and looking at that. We've had conversations again about that language piece. And I think, you know, if the experts here in the room are helping kind of rewrite what we should be saying and really focusing this through a justice lens, I think there's a lot to be done here in partnership with everyone. So I want to pause. Do we have our question, evaluation question to come up? Oh, okay. Thanks, Jennifer. You're welcome. Andrea, I love seeing all the folks that are chiming in about wanting to get farm to school grants. Um, I think this is, this is great. <laughs> um, Okay. People are still voting. Awesome. Thanks, Frank. So as I indicated, there'll be there'll be um, some materials coming out to all of you um, here within the next week is our goal. Great. Awesome. Great. Okay, good. I'm glad folks felt like this was a good use of your time. <laughs> Here's number two. How useful was the information provided today? I think when we were planning this discussion, we were really thinking about trying to give a couple of examples that had been implemented at that community level that were supported um, with federal funding and with just a, a, a level of creativity and a level of flexibility built within that funding that'll work at that community level. Awesome. And if it, if it hasn't um, been indicated clearly enough, all of us are here um, in the, in the uh, federal space uh, to provide, you know, resources and, and um, um, technical assistance and support um, as you're diving into this space and whether it's connecting you to someone local in your community with a like size community, whether it's thinking about how to walk across from an education or an ag side to the behavioral health side and navigating that space, um, please know that that's a resource um, that we're able to offer and support um, and are, are, I feel that we're all very approachable with that. So thank you. Okay. And then Yes, so we've been thinking a little bit strategically about the learners in this space who joined us just to essentially kind of grow some knowledge and, and know what's out there uh, for strategies, for funding, for resources, and just for partners that are, that are looking for the same kind of common goal here. Um, is there a need for something like that in the future, whether it's a, we do something on an annual basis and we give updates to funding or research or champions in the community um, that's what this next question is about. Um, and then there are folks, as I indicated, that are ready to kind of roll up their sleeves and, <laughs> and dive into this. So here's our, that's our last poll. Yes, so we will share all the resources that are in the chat. Um, and then I think our last, um, 
poll question is going to be something that's entered into the chat and it's more of just an open ended for folks. So well good i'm glad there's a need for a future virtual town hall that sounds that sounds exciting. Um, so indicated in the chat it's um, if if there's if there are other things that you're that we missed or there's you know feedback please we've got thick skin we're new to this but we're. We're trying to improve and grow. Um, if there are folks that are chomping at the bit to join us on any of the planning of this too, I will plug make a plug for that too. Um, and then Andrea, I see you listed the link for Menti. Uh, if you could list it one more time, because it looks like it's scrolling to the top. We want to leave on a high note today. So if you wouldn't mind just chiming in or, you know, a, a, from a justice lens, we want to lead on, a, on an opportunity to improve and grow. So growth and development. So if you wouldn't mind leaving us a word, we'll get kind of fancy here, thanks to Andrea's leadership, um, to just kind of close us out with some of the work that you all are doing. And we're, we feel super privileged to be able to showcase that and work collaboratively with you um, and look forward to kind of future efforts. Um, so more to, more to come from us. To my co-presenters, did I miss anything? Anything you wanna call out with our last 60 seconds? All right. Awesome. Well, thanks, Tracy. We've got some really great uh, words coming in. Um, I think gen generally positive, informative, motivating, inspiring, inspirational, um, progress, uh, hopeful, optimistic, inclusive, really, really neat. <laughs> I see some uh, volunteering happening in the chat box from the state of North Dakota. We'll find you. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We'll 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 hold you to your to the full two hours. Please go stretch your legs. Um, expect some follow up from us, and um, please you know join us in this journey as we're as we're kind of walking side by side with a lot of um, state, local, national organizations um, that are centering this work as well. So, um, thanks again for your time today, and we look forward to working with you all in the future. See ya.